Last week I had, I wouldn't say a little bit of a traumatic experience, but definitely a challenging experience uh, when I spent uh, two big game sessions playing or trying to play Pericles by Mark Herman, published by GMT. If you watch my video for that game, you will see that that is a very challenging game with a very complicated game engine and one that, um, that has a lot of ideas that do not feel intuitive, do not flow one into the other. So it is one that has a very hard learning curve, very high entry point. After that experience, after working for hours and hours and hours on this design that even after a lot of work, just uh, kept feeling like the sum of the parts, not very organic. It is, after you put in a lot of effort. So after struggling for a long time, I decided I needed a break. I decided I needed something simpler, easier, more refreshing and free-flowing. And so I took out an old classic, A. Lau, that was published a couple of years ago in the Strategy and Tactics magazine. It is a game that depicts uh, the famous battle between the French and the Russian during the Napoleonic Wars. It is a game that is known among war gamers as an excellent intro war game. Together with the Napoleon at Waterloo, it is one of those classic games that are very often used uh, to introduce new players to war gaming. And since viewers of my videos have asked me to make videos about introductory war games, I thought, why not? Actually, this is one that I never thought about covering in a video, but it is a game that definitely fits the bill because it is simple. It is very accessible, and it also happens to be a very good game. Ooh, spoilers from my from my conclusions here. Yes, it happens to be one of these training games that is not just a training game. It's not one of those games whose only value is in the fact that you can use it to introduce somebody else, which you can do. But also it is fun to play per se, even after you become a seasoned veteran war gamer, you are still likely to enjoy this game. But now I'm really anticipating too much on my conclusions. A Lao, two player game that also is uh, very solo friendly. You can definitely play this game by yourself, by playing both sides at the best of their possibilities. The Russians are coming and pushing against the French and the French have to figure out what to do about that. This is the general idea. Let me show you how the game works. The board of the game is printed on paper and yes, when you look at it by today's standard, it may not be a knockout, but it is functional. It, it still find it pleasant. Maybe I'm just retro that way. I still find its overall, uh, its overall look pleasant, if not again like astounding. But what really interests me is how pleasant it is from the gameplay point of view. It is an interesting landscape here. And also the map is fully functional, so I'm perfectly happy. Also, you have several displays here, the combo resolution table, an air that is used for um, for units that are reforming. You put them there as they're waiting to be reformed. A turn track with a space where you can place your reinforcements. It works. You have terrain effects. It's a nice map, again, if not particularly good looking by today's standards. But I was talking about the gameplay qualities. Well, during the game, the French will start in this area here and the Russians will be more or less around here with some of the groups in the background and the Russians will have the task of attacking the French as they're trying to take control of this town here. Victory at the end is assigned based on victory points that you score by eliminating enemy units and also the Russians will score a lot of points if they manage to take the town of Eilau. Which may not be all that easy because, uh, well, look at all of these rivers. As you can imagine, attacking across a river will give you a penalty, so the French will have a nice defense here. The Russians uh, can try to just attack frontally, and that's one approach. Can try to spread around and try to outflank the French. The French also has some people here, so flanking them here may cause you to get caught in a pincers here. It seems much more profitable to try to flank them this way but alas here's the trick later in the game you will have a group of French reformers coming from here so if you do um, turn around uh, you manage to turn a flank here and you, your flank is just looking a bit like a hook here then again you can, may get caught between two lines of French so very interesting situation here total uh, frontal charge or 
or massive flanking maneuvers uh, seem to be doomed or at least very risky so maybe you'll have to do a little bit of both maybe you'll have to adapt to the circumstances but definitely between this interesting defensive area here and the feature uh the features created by the reinforcement schedule you have an interesting situation overall now as for gameplay gameplay is very simple the good old days when in order to have a war game all that we needed to do was to have uh adding reinforcements to the board moving like a side moves any other units they stop moving when they get adjacent to an enemy unit because the old units project as well controlling the six surrounding access after movement you have combat and then you resolve retreats advance at the combat and that and that's pretty much it really that's that's what most of what happens in a turn there are a couple of other interesting twists though uh the units are represented by these counters again nothing that will win a beauty contest in, in, in a counter beauty contest but they work they do what they need to do you have silhouettes that tell you uh the type of unit from infantry cavalry artillery and leaders also units are uh, are marked by color so that may be a problem for the colorblind you may want to mark your units differently they're marked by colors as being controlled by certain leaders as belonging to certain formations so this leader here control all of these guys and this leader here controls all of these guys and again all other units or most of the units belong to specific groups uh, units can still move uh, wherever wherever they are on the map but they cannot attack and uh, move adjacent to enemy units unless they start the turn within five axes from their leader and also capturing leaders can be very useful for example if the russian player manages to capture napoleon then that is an instant victory and what a major what if what a major what if in history uh, units have two values printed on them the combat value and the movement value again it's really uh, it's really war game 101 is some of the most basic concepts that you can imagine and I'm putting these guys here on the board not even because I'm really gonna use them necessarily mm, but it looks better if it's not entirely empty so as I said turn structure is the simplicity itself as a player russian player first moves then attacks with all units that are adjacent to enemy units after after combat so it's very important because remember the combat is mandatory also uh if if a cavalry unit manages to attack an opponent after moving for four uh, four hexes in a straight line then the unit gets a charge bonus so that is neat uh, this game does not feature uh, retreat before combat for cavalry attack by infantry does not feature squares so it keeps things simple but you have a couple of bonuses that give a little bit of tactical depth so you have a bonus for cavalry that managed to charge in a straight line you have a bonus for combined arms uh, that is if you're attacking with artillery cavalry and infantry once you're attacking you can pile up units from several axes against a defender in a single x and you compare the total strength of the attackers with the total strength of the opponent or the defender you turn that into a ratio and then you check the combat table here you have the combat result table and I guess if you played any war game before, you know how it goes from here. You simply roll a die and you may apply possible modifiers to the column that you're using, depending on the situation. And then you cross-reference the result of the die with the column that you're using based on the ratio between the strength of the attacker and the strength of the defender. When in between two columns, then he goes uh, to the column that is most advantageous to the defender. In other, in other words, you round things down. There's nothing here between 1-1 one, one and 2-1. I do like war games that have the 1.5 column. Because here, for example, if you're attacking with 6 strength points against 6 strength points, then you get the 1-1. But here, if you're attacking with 11 strength points 
against those same six strength points, then you still round down to one to one. Uh, even if you're just one point from two to one. It's a small thing, but uh, again, I believe it was a matter of keeping the design simple. You would not believe how many were gamers I've met that struggle with figuring out uh, the 1.5 column. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, I can do it, but I know it's not that easy for everybody. So, well, so be it. This, this, uh, this combat table doesn't have it. Small gripe, small gripe, really. What is interesting, however, if you look at the combat result table, is that you see is particularly non-violent. It's like Gandhi did it? I mean, how? Because most of the results will be retreats, defender retreats and attacker retreats. Sometimes you have an exchange, but see, it's pretty hard to pull off an exchange, which means that first the defender is eliminated and then the attacker needs to eliminate a number of units to match the strength of the defender that was eliminated. And occasionally, very rarely, you will have the defender eliminated or the attacker eliminated. But very tough. So, as you're just gonna displace enemy units and nothing else? Yes, unless you plan carefully, because as it happens in games that emphasize retreat rather than direct damage, uh, an enemy unit is eliminated when retreats into well, when it should retreat into forbidden X and it can't. And units cannot retreat into access occupied by enemies or access controlled by enemies. That means and you need to surround your opponents, place your units strategically around them, and then force them in a situation in which they cannot retreat. And that is the main way in which you eliminate units in this game. It's not, it's not a unique concept. Many other games have this. And again, this is I see this mainly as an introductory war game. And if you are playing with somebody who's not familiar with war games, so that actually is a good concept to teach them the importance again of position, maneuver, etc., etc., as opposed to I don't know somebody who didn't play many war games, who hasn't played a war games, may just think it's all about you know frontal strength, and this forces them to think in terms of more organic and dynamic maneuvers. But this is pretty much the idea. Well, you know, you have a procedure that allows you to uh, take units that were eliminated and reformed and after a couple of turns so that they can come back. Uh, but overall, overall is an extremely simple, minimalistic even design. Get reinforcements, move, uh, stop moving when you enter a zone of control, attack, uh, they are all mandatory attacks as long as you're adjacent to an opponent, resolve combat, your turn is over, the opponent takes their own turn, and that the general turn is over, and you continue like this until either a player meets a condition for instant victory, or until at the end of the game victory is assigned based on victory points. So, a loud, definitely, uh, there is a reason why this game is a little bit of a classic, because it definitely has those qualities that I, uh, that I mentioned in the introduction. It is a very good introductory war game, together with Napoleon of Waterloo, if you're trying to figure out how to introduce a, a new friend to war gaming, this is an excellent choice, because it has very intuitive rules, so very simple ideas, you do not have to worry about stacking, you do not have to worry about a lot of other elements, but it does introduce some of the basic concepts of war gaming, it has like, like enemy zones of control, uh, the combat ratio table, yes, sometimes that feels old school, but I still like it, I still think it's a, it's a staple of war gaming, and even if there's a new game that comes out nowadays that has it, I don't feel that the game is dated, I feel that that's just good. That's, that's a good way of doing things, of getting things done. So it really is a game that introduces basic ideas of war gaming that then a new aspiring war gamer can port to a lot of different situations and designs. While at the same time, it is a very playable, very enjoyable game. Again, even for seasoned war gamers that maybe just uh, decide to take a break from, from Mark Herman's challenging designs or that simply do not have like a long evening, they want to play a game in, in a couple of hours, um, they want to take a break from, from the bigger fair and they want to see a fun, interesting actions that has a lot of challenges, has a lot of interesting points and again is not too demanding in terms of rules. Even if you played 20 years ago and you're gonna reread the entire rules before you play it again, it's not gonna take you long because it's like three pages of rules. 
very simple, very basic, down to the basics, but not simplistic because the situation that comes out on the board is still very interesting. The elements that you have, I mean, the three defining elements, the initial placement of the units, of course, that will influence how the action moves from there. The schedule reinforcements, that is super fun, that adds that extra challenge for the Russian player because you do have to defend one of your flanks from a fairly large number of French units that are going to come from that direction which otherwise will look like a very attractive flank uh, to try to outflank the surround. So I wonder actually there if there's a little bit of foreknowledge that may come in the way, like as the Russian player knows that those reinforcements are coming and therefore the, the Russian player can rely on information that maybe certainly wasn't available. I don't think that's big of a deal because the challenge is still there. Actually, as the Russian player, you're still likely from time to time to try that outflank just in the hope that you will gain enough progress that you are now resettled in a solid position by the time the French arrive. So even then you may still be tempted to do it. And if not, if you feel that's a problem, or that roll a die to decide whether or not you're going to take that information into account, if, especially if you're playing the game in solitaire. Uh, other than if you're playing with two players, you can still you can still have that. In case you want to try to flank the um, the French from that direction, roll a die, and you can do it on a roll on. 1 to 4 on a 6 sided die, 5 to 6, uh, your that option is not available, you need to plan differently. And you can just mod the design very easily. So the reinforcements are interesting, the terrain is interesting because you have all of those rivers around the allow that, uh, that the French player can try to exploit for defensive positions and of course as soon as the Russian painfully and slowly manages to go past those rivers then since it's a several rivers one past the other then also um, the uh, russian player can um, can take advantage of those of those rivers or streams uh, as a defensive asset against a possible french counterattacks but it really is a matter for the french player to try to delay the russian advance uh, while waiting for reinforcements and the Russian player also will get some reinforcements much, much later in the game and not in a, such a decisive fashion. So the elements that you have in, in the war game, I should say in a war game, what we expect um, what we expect the moving parts of a war game engine to do are definitely all present here, terrain, the placement of units, capability of units, combined arms, so that's a really it's a small touch, but it's a nice touch because it's nice to try to put the, uh, your forces together to get that bonus. All of these elements uh, are really combined well. I mean, this is what a war game should do to give a situation which is interesting, full of challenges, full of small problems to solve, and a still. It's, again, it's not a collection of small little events. You get the sense of a large organic event that then needs to be broken down into its smaller moving parts, into many small foci of action, many small fights that you're trying to set up as I'm trying to surround this guy, as I'm trying to concentrate forces in this area, etc., etc., while at the same time keeping in mind the overall architecture of the attack or of my defense, depending on the side that I'm playing. Really, there's a sense of, of, of organicity of the different elements of the design, from the single fight to the overall uh, considerations that you need to make about your line of attack or defense. That is nice, that, that works very well. For a game that is so simple, that plays in a single evening, that has three pages of rules, that is very accessible, that you can play for somebody who is completely, um, completely unaware of anything that happened in war game, somebody who thinks that Stratego is the knee plus ultra of war gaming, then this is a game that you can play with them. And for a game that is accessible to that crowd, it is still remarkably fun and remarkably enjoyable, even for the season war gamer. So I was happy that I remembered about this game. <laughs> I took it out of the uh, of the uh, plastic uh, Ziploc bag in which I keep I keep the magazine together with the, with the game and the pieces. I'm glad because I had a very good time playing this game, and I'm glad that also the idea of finally uh, sharing this uh, with with my viewers because it's a solid intro game that I think if you don't know it yet you 
please try to track a copy down on eBay, which shouldn't be all that hard. It is just a solid game, one that probably everywhere gamers should have in their collection, and one that definitely is gonna see a lot of views if you start using it as a way to introduce students to basic concepts of board gaming. So, uh, Alao with Strategy and Tactics magazine, a little bit of a classic among, among war gamers, and I guess a classic of introductory war gaming, definitely a game that has earned its title and that has achieved the status for a variety of good reasons.